but our hearts kind of changed like in that process of doing that for five years or so to where we came to a point of like, you know, we, we want to step in and now adopt some of these kids, you know, be a forever home. Scott, man, it's so good to have you on the, the Grove Collective podcast. Yeah, and we are in a, a new series titled Family Matters, and mm. it's practical ways to love your family well. Mm. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And man, I am so excited to have you join us again because we're going to talk about something that I think is it's super important. It's also near and dear to your heart. Yeah. And I, um, growing up myself, I think, I don't think I was unofficially mm -hmm. fostered and adopted mm. by close friends growing up. Mm. And I know that made the drastic impact on my life. It saves my life, it really did. Yeah, no, I've heard you talk about yeah. that before. In various, even various places, right? Yes. Different kind of people that became yeah. those step in totally. foster type. And all friends. throughout yeah. my life, all throughout my life. And I think it's a reminder of how important family is for our yeah. spiritual health, for our physical health, mm. for, our mm. for everything, yeah. for our emotional health too. It truly is. And so you um, are super passionate about fostering and adopting. And can you just share yeah. how that came about for yeah. you and your wife? Yeah, definitely. So we, you know, a lot of people, well, people get into it for different reasons, of course, right? And for a lot of people, from the adoption thing, maybe they can't have children or something and then they go on that road, which is great. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. For us, we did have three biological children, right? So um, now that still wasn't all easy. <laughs> no, <laughs> there was there was there was a lot, there was a lot of. I was, you had more than enough for like me getting ready to have one. I'm like three. Yeah, all yeah, right. No, and there, there a was, lot of people are content with three, and you guys right. were like, that, well, there was, yes, and then you know, unfortunately, some just losses of mm, pregnancies right in between and, and mm. different things like that. So that was that was a big journey to get there. But when we when we had uh, Colton, our third, uh, Jewel said, you know, I'm, in terms of me going down this road in this way, bearing children, I think I've really come to a close with that, but I don't feel that I'm at a kind of a stopping point or that we are a stopping point in terms of caring for mm -hmm. other children. So it's kind of a unique thing, right? And we did have like one friend that they had done some foster care. And, I grew up in a family, we didn't do foster care. My, I, I'm not adopted and my siblings aren't, you right. know, same thing for her. So foster care and adoption, it was all brand new. We knew zero, nothing about it. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, so real quick, long story short is we get to that place, we have these three kids. She's like, you know, I just feel like we're not done. And foster care just kind of popped up from just knowing one person that did that. She's like, I think that's it. We looked into it, saw that in Arizona, and, it, 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 and this is still true to this day, this was years ago that, that we started that process, but still to this day, we, just one of the highest states in the country for how many kids are in the foster care system. There's just thousands of them mm. all the time. So we're like, yeah, that's it. And we just started that process of getting licensed uh, to do foster care. And that was a process for sure, and got through it and started it and man it was it was something <laughs> yeah i love that you said your wife had this statement of i don't think we're done caring for mm -hmm. more children right so we're done us biologically having right. some of our own but right. we're not done caring for more children mm -hmm. and i think that is one of the most beautiful perspectives that more christians should embody mm. Because like, when are we ever really done, you know? Right, right, and right. I think that it's also just a beautiful, beautiful picture of the gospel too. It really yeah. is. Yeah, and even, I mean, for sure, and it even takes me back to your own story though, right? Yeah. Of those people that thankfully they weren't done saying, hey, we're gonna care for oh, totally. these guys. I mean, that was, you know. Well, you know what's so funny, man? Even as my brother and I, package deal, identical twins, <laughs> we were 15 years old when we met our best friend's family who kind of became like, they weren't even the last family that cared for us. Mm. There was more after that, but they had mostly girls and they had mm. one son. And then they had, then, then we came into the picture. And I remember I was even talking to Josh, Josh Havens. Yeah. And he was like, dude, 
they took you in and they had four girls at home? He was like, they're out of their mind. Yeah. Like, what? He's <laughs> right. like, I would never do that. Right. And I was like, well, thank God they did, man. Yeah. And yeah. you're welcoming all of it, the potential for yeah. so much pain, sure. so much right. danger, all of it. All you of are. it, all of it. And some, t- you know, and you saying that just reminds me that it's funny how we think as parents if we have a child biologically, we somehow don't have to worry about any of that. We're immune like we to get, that. And we get to like choose, uh, like, no, no, not, no. It's, it's still, you don't know. You're still, by having this child, even if it's biological, you're opening yourself up for, we don't, we don't know all of what this is gonna look like and entail, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not, I mean, I, I, I get it. I get what people are saying, right? Of course, and what they maybe, and maybe especially if there's been trauma that, you know, these kids have gone through and stuff. So right. I, I get it. But it's just, it's not to say, the, the, the sort of the little backhanded thought is like, oh, I'd rather just control everything and yeah. have one. <laughs> Which is <laughs> an illusion. You're not it's an illusion. Get, yeah. You're not yeah. But you know, you said how it's a picture of the gospel. So, you know, it's I, a beautiful picture of the gospel, man. It, it is for sure. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of verses. This is just one in Romans uh, 8 that says, that the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit that you receive, talking about the, the Holy Spirit, of course, brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Mm. So um, that adoption to sonship, and it's not like sons, like not just daughters, obviously it's both, It's that's the, the idea of all of what it, you know, in that culture that becoming an heir to someone at all, yeah. that you get full uh, rights and privileges of being an heir to, uh, to this new family, this new yeah. father that you have, and that's who we are in Christ. So it is totally biblical, and for us, that was definitely a part of it. We understood, you know, we've, God's adopted us, right? We are all his adopted. I mean, the Bible, I, the Bible is a come home story. Mm. I mean, it starts with Adam and Eve. They're home in that garden with God. Yeah. And because of, you know, their choices and sin that happens, they're removed from that. And then God just never gives up and goes to work, constantly going at, after providing a way for them and us to come back home to him. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so this is the language of adoption and family and, and we cry out, Father, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And so we, we did foster care for like five years. And during that process, I mean, it, um, some of it was, uh, was wonderful and like, you know, beautiful and, um, you know, even easy, I could say at times, and other things were extremely difficult and hard and even ugly in ways. I mean, it was just, it was all of it, you know, just all the ups and downs. But our hearts kind of changed like in that process of doing that for five years or so to where we came to a point of like, you know, we we want to step in and now adopt some of these kids, you know, be a forever home. I yeah. mean, it's great to do foster care. That's great. It's needed. It it's is. It's hugely needed. For sure. And and a foster, a good foster home is always is always the best option when a child can't be in their, you know, biological nuclear right, home, right. then the next best option as opposed to an orphanage or something else, right? I mean, the, 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 I think the, the next best option would be a foster home yeah. because of the very nature of what you're saying. I mean, it's a, it is a home, it is a family. So you're trying to put that kid in the next closest place of where they should be, yeah. but can't be yeah. for whatever the reasons are. So we said, you know, we wanna be that for some kids, be their forever uh, placement, their forever home. And so that led us to uh, to adoption. So we adopted, um, you know, ultimately uh, three kids in that process. So yeah. so there's six kids. Six six kids, two up and out of the house. So we have four oh, wow. in, in yeah. the house, which yeah. is still plenty. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet. Yeah. It, uh, it reminds me too, even when Jesus and John talks about how he goes to prepare a place for us. Mm-hmm. And you told me this was one of your dad's favorite verses that he really mm-hmm. relied heavily on as he approached the end of his, of his yeah. life. And it has me think of what comes to our mind when we think about home and when we think about the best things about home. Because I know a lot of us have broken homes, right? And especially kids in the system, maybe their idea of home is fear, right? Or mm-hmm. terror or insecurity, not stable. But when you think about the the best example of home and why I think the family unit is so important mm-hmm. is because home is a place where you know you belong, no matter yeah. what, no matter what. Right. It's a place where you will always find unconditional love. Mm-hmm. It's a place where I think of peace and rest 
mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. When you think about the best. And so as Christians and as sons and daughters in God's kingdom, we are supposed to be people that bring about those values, you know? Yeah. And in, in essence, yeah. that's what you're doing for these children that you're adopting. Right, trying to create that type of space. Yeah. That every one of us as humans need. Yes. For sure. Need yeah. it. And it's kind of like that is heaven on earth too, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It is. So we experience right. that here and now. And we get glimpses of it. And then, and then I love that saying of like we're all just walking each other home, you know? Mm-hmm. You need to write a book. I don't know what you, you alluded to it. The Bible is a coming home story. Yeah. That's powerful, man. Yeah, it's a come home story. It's a come home story, yeah. for sure. I mean, we see, you know, we, we always think of that in, that in the prodigal son story, but yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why we all love that story so much. You know, I mean, there's a lot going on there, there's a lot, it's beautiful, but you have this son that does come back home. But but that is, yeah, that's that's the story of the Bible. It's, it's And that's the story of what every single human heart longs for when you think about it, mm-hmm. truly. Yeah. Truly. Right. Those things that home provides for us. Right. Yeah, what it is, what it provides, th- that environment. Yeah. And it does. It goes back to, I mean, I think it goes back to how we're created. How And when we look at the picture of, I mean, think of that Garden of Eden and what that environment entailed and looked like before the fall. I mean, it was, I mean, you, it, it doesn't get better than that, you know? Mm. So, yeah. So, Biblically, we want to you know get back to that, but then here in our families, we want to create spaces that are full of the qualities yeah. that we see represented in yeah. in a home in the Bible, in, the, in God's kingdom, in a relationship with Him. For sure, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. tell tell me about the the kind of the highs and lows, maybe the the beauty and the pain that has come along with that process for you. And then also, like, I know you have a different perspective of the gospel because it's kind of like you Yeah, you know, one of the, for sure. And I mean, I would say, hands down, like, we, we know that the gospel is this story of this radical love God pursues us and, he, and his, his, his grace is poured out, right? And, and we know we're not worthy of it, you know? It's not like we got our act together and that's why, you know, we know that, you know, he first loved us while we were sinners, he died for us, all that, yeah. right? Um, and so I always like knew that, like in my head and theologically and biblically and talked about it and preached on it, all that stuff. Um, but man, doing foster care and forming these relationships and bonds and having some of them just be really difficult, hard things. And I'm, and I'm thinking of like previous foster kids, like going back to, yeah. you know, years back. I mean, some situations that was so difficult, but we were like, but, but we're doing this, you know? Like we're taking care of you. You're in our home at this time. Yeah. Um, I, I just kind of realized, you know, this is, this is what grace is about. I mean, this is unconditional love. And that's very simple, very uh, a central idea of unconditional love. Man, became real in a whole new way. Yeah. Because even though you're bringing these kids in, you think maybe that they're gonna, I love that and appreciate it and be easy or whatever, but for various reasons, I mean, not all of them do. Some of them really resist it, you yeah. know? And it's just sad because of everything that's, what they've experienced, their trauma, their brokenness. So they're actually sometimes really fighting against this, right? Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's heartbreaking and there's, a, there's a, a whole lot that goes into that. But from the parent side of it, it's like, uh, even though you're fighting this so badly, I wanna keep loving you yeah. and you're not really giving me a reason to, and this, this is unconditional love. And then you realize, oh, you're me. This this is what God thinks totally. when He's looking at me. Totally. I'm always I'm pushing back on Him. I'm resisting Him. I'm kicking and fighting back. Yeah. I'm not being thankful and generous and grateful and yeah. and just you know just oh and just what can I do to help? And I just you've done so much for me. I just yeah. want to be so obedient and just you know follow your every wish and like yeah. nope I don't do that stuff with God either. Even though He's welcomed me home, but like I'm you. And yeah. That's, and what does God do? He keeps loving me. He mm-hmm. keeps well. He keeps accepting me. He you know, keeps pouring out grace. And I'm like, well, man, there you have it. This, yeah. this is this is what. So something that I unconditional love, grace that I knew, 
Like yeah, it's I one thing knew, to know it to I preach knew, it, and I knew it in a, yeah. I, in a whole different way. Lovely. Well, because you lived it, man, you lived mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and that leads me to the next question too. It's one thing to know it. It's one thing to preach it. It's one thing to know the theology behind it. But then you actually lived it. Why is it such a difficult problem here in Arizona? Why are there so many kids in the system here? Do you think? I know. Mm, you, yeah, you, you could speak um, to that. How can we make a difference? Yeah, in that? I'm not. I mean, I'm not sure if just where we're located or what's going on. Like, you know, like I haven't looked at all, like why specifically in Arizona yeah. as opposed to some other states, do they have different, you know, policies and programs and do they have better preventative things where they're able to kind of step in and resource and help before the things get so bad that the kid has to be removed, right? I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of things that go into yeah. it, but I just, but they're always, you know, agencies coming to churches, going to families. Will you consider doing this? And, and I, I mean, I can still fall on this, but I think people, a lot of times we make decisions um, based on the outcome. So we think, we, when, we, when we decide to do something on outcome-based thinking, then that's thinking of what's this going to cost me? Mm. And is this going to really like satisfy me and benefit me? And so we start asking those questions. We start asking questions like, well, if I do that, how's it gonna make me feel? Um, what's, what's this gonna require of me? Yeah. Uh, what's gonna be the long-term impact on me if I do this, right? So my whole decision-making process then is based on what are the outcomes gonna be on me if I do this. But if we're like, hey, we wanna love like Jesus, then, and not just with, I mean, this is just like a way of thinking, right? Yeah. I mean, you can apply it to foster care, and I think people do. We apply it across the board. Then I'm, I'm not thinking of those outcomes. I'm thinking more of, of who I, my identity almost. Like, no, th I'm a child of God. I mean, look, I'm remembering I've been adopted. Mm -hmm. God's, his unconditional love for me, like I was talking about the kid, and how you, you flip it around, you realize I'm that kid. This is how God views and treats me and loves me. Holy cow. Okay, so this is who I am. Then I, then you kind of make decisions. You start thinking of what's, what is the cost going to have on you? if I do this or not do this. Mm. Now what's it gonna cost me? What, what's it gonna cost you? How's this gonna benefit you yeah. if I step into this? And we ask different questions of like, is this, is this consistent with who I am as a child of God to love in this way, to yeah. do this? Um, yeah. is, uh, is this, uh, what, would a, what would a person like me with this identity do in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. And so we just start thinking more out of our identity of who we are in Christ yeah. and allow and kind of lead with love from that yeah. as opposed to, hey, I'm just thinking of the, of the, of the outcomes that this is gonna have yeah. on, on me, how it's gonna affect me if I do it. So, and the truth is we, it's easy for us to forget that and we just, Instead of, hey, what cost is this gonna have on you and for you if I do it, we think, no, what's this gonna cost me? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, is it gonna satisfy me or benefit me? And truthfully, I mean, so we're talking about families, so I mean, a little sidestep here, it's probably a big problem with marriages ultimately ending because most of us in marriage, there comes a time or a season where one of you kind of realizes, man, what I'm putting into this marriage the cost that I'm, that it's requiring of me, the yeah. sacrifice, I'm not getting much back in return. Yeah, it's not equaling out at all. And then, and then they're like, you know what? This is costing me way more than I'm getting in return. Yeah, and that, which is sad. That shouldn't be. But, but, but since that becomes a reality, then we're like, you know, maybe I'm, I'm gonna move on. Yeah, and you know, and we can all get that from a logical standpoint. Yeah, but. Um, I think it's dangerous when we view relationships transactionally. Right. And that's what we do in America too, in our culture for sure. Yeah. Um, and even dating relationships too, to even back it up even further. It's like, we get into that relationship for how it can benefit me and what am I getting mm -hmm. out of this? And then right. when we are in marriage and we're thinking that way too, that's a recipe for disaster and a way to keep us miserable. And it also reminds me, the closer we get to the heart of God, the less our focus is on ourselves and the more mm -hmm. it becomes on others and how we can make a difference in their life too, you know? Yeah, and then we're making, then we're gonna make 
better decisions out of love for yeah. the benefit of others. It's not transactional. Rather than, yet, yeah, yeah. how does it make me feel? Am I gonna be satisfied? Yeah. Is this, am I gonna like this? It's so, it's like, like you just said it. A lot of times we weigh the pros and cons of decisions. What if you just went back to who you are in Christ? Mm -hmm. Like this is who I am as a, a son of God, as a, a daughter of God, as a child of God. This is who I am. Right. So this is how I right. act. Right. Not, well, what, if, what am I gonna gain from this? How does this benefit me? And we do have to take care of ourselves at the end of the day. I'm not saying not to take yeah, care of yeah. ourselves because you have to take care of yourself to take care of others, but mm -hmm. we can't live with that transactional mindset. We right. can't. Yeah, no, I love that phrase, yeah. Think, thinking of relationships transactionally. Yeah, we do. Um, and that's just not, yeah, I mean, going, you know, kind of going full circle back to the gospel, back to this story. Man, I mean, thank goodness God didn't view us that way. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't have anything to no. offer. We didn't have, we could just kind of messed it up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're the the worst return on investment mm -hmm. ever. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's, it's about yeah. love and relationship. It's clear as day. It really is. I even think about the family that raised my brother and I in high school, and they had five biological kids. They adopted a, a young boy and girl, so that's seven, and then my brother and I came into the picture, so that's nine. That's crazy. And they had grandma in the house who was like... <laughs> A full-time babysitter? No. She was being cared for. Oh, she was man. being cared for. Oh, and she and she eventually was on hospice in the home. That's 10 people that wow. this mom and dad were caring for. And I would go to Costco with them. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> the bill was always thousands, dude. Because <laughs> we would eat them out of a house and home. My brother, he'll call me and he'll be like, man, I've got, I've got some boys hanging out. And he's like, they're eating all my food. And, I, and I'm, I remind him, I'm like, you know how much food we ate when we were living at home? Yeah. Like, dude, yeah. don't even. Thousands, man. Yeah, That's but transactional. Lot. There we go. We're counting the cost, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny, man. No, there. That's a man. That's an example of people that are living for the benefit of others. They are. They're they're not. They're living. They're not looking at the, what outcome is this going to have on me. No. They're looking at the, who, who am I? Yes. Is this is this how someone like me in Christ lives and loves? Amen. Yep. Amen. It is okay. I'll go do that. Literally <laughs> living in the kingdom of God. Truly. Truly, the mom would always say, it's not my money, it's God's money, you know? There you go. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> um, for anybody who maybe ha is fostering, has yeah. adopted, is even thinking about it, what kind of support do we have at the Grove for for families yeah. that, are, that are in Perfect. that? Perfect, yeah, definitely. So we... Um, uh, a couple months before summer, then we took a, like a, a month off, but we're continuing now. We have a foster care and adoption support group that meets once a month. Uh, the next one coming up, I think, is the last Sunday in August. So it's usually toward the end of the, but it's on the website and all that stuff. Okay. And uh, and we we just we meet together for like an hour and a half. We've got child care because it's a foster care yeah. and adoption support group. So <laughs> child care is pretty much a necessity. And um, and it's great. We do. I mean, obviously, we support each other. We, you know, we share stories and pray for each other. We do all those things that you would, you know, expect. And then, then we always have like a topic or a theme, and we just sort of interact with that in different ways. Usually, there's some type of like little teaching training time that maybe we do, or we bring someone in mm. uh, to talk, like like we have, like to talk about trauma for a bit, you know, or whatever whatever the topic might be for that time. And then we have just some questions and conversations around that. So so it's good. So we kind of want to offer that like helpful piece around that theme, but but it's like we've talked about, it's about the relationships, it's about those people connecting, I mean, and just sharing their stories and, and a lot of times just getting, you know, just being able to to talk about it with other people that get it. Yeah. Because they do it. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's like a lot of things. I mean, unless you're doing that, you don't fully really get it. And foster care adoption is definitely one of those things, mm -hmm. right? You, I mean, you really only fully, fully get it when you're kind of doing, you can, so, yeah, so that's open to anyone doing foster care adoption. Love to have them there. It's like 4 p.m. last Sunday of the month. Sweet, man. Sweet. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, beautiful reminder that we're all adopted. And living with that perspective of relationships aren't transactional. Mm. How can I make a difference in the lives of others because of who I am in Christ? Yeah. That's it, that's yeah. it. 
Thanks, Scott. Thank you yeah. for sharing today, man. It's powerful stuff. Appreciate it. Thanks for having it. me on yeah. talking about it. Appreciate it. Of course, man.